Hi, this is Dr. Bernstein of Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University with our October 2022 edition. Uh, let me uh, update you. We're going to be giving episodes of our teleseminar periodically. You can find out when by going to YouTube, searching for Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University, and then selecting the latest uh, episode. Uh, you could also click the button uh, f to subscribe and you will be automatically notified every time a new issue appears. Before we start answering questions, let me remind you that my answers are generic answers. They're not necessarily the answers that uh, the submitter is seeking uh, because I cannot get, do a physical exam on them. I can't get a complete history. I can't get a family history. I can't even get a whole list of all the medications the person's getting. And if he gave such a list, it would be too long for me to read uh, uh, to all of you. Uh, therefore, I give generic answers that may or may not be correct, but hopefully will be educational. And that's the purpose of these teleseminars. Uh, the first question, please share your thoughts on the dead and in bed syndrome. Well, first of all, it's not a syndrome, it's an event. Syndromes usually occur over and over. Uh, uh, whereas dead in bed tends to occur only once. Uh, so it's not a syndrome, it's an event. And this person asks, how could this happen when sleeping if one only has long acting insulin in their system and non strenuous exercise before bed? Wouldn't the body release glucagon and other chemicals to raise blood sugar? Well, first of all, I think this person should read my book, Diabetes Solution, to learn more about diabetes. Um, but when a diabetic has a low blood sugar, if he's lucky, he'll release glucagon, epinephrine, and other hormones, but they may not work fast, as fast as the insulin. And here this person is doing exercise before bedtime, and the exercise as a rule in most uh, diabetics that I've been exposed to, tends to keep blood sugars low for an extended period of time, not just for an hour or two. So, uh, here he has insulin, long-acting insulin working. He has some exercise making him more sensitive to the insulin that he injected. And he doesn't know how fast the glucagon is going to be produced and how fast it's going to take to work. Um, and insulin can be much more potent than glucagon depending upon the dose that you give. Uh, you can certainly overwhelm the glucagon that the body produces by giving enough insulin. By the way, the uh, classic insulin treatment for diabetes that the American Diabetes Association used for years was to give one large dose of long-acting insulin that works all day long, and they would cover that dose with food. That is, per, the patient would get a big shot of insulin and be eating all day long to um, uh, prevent the blood sugar from going too low. So that long acting insulin, depending on the dose, uh, can be lowering you all day long and certainly in the nighttime. I'm 48 year, year old type one diabetic. I've had very good blood glucose control. <clears throat> Toward the end of 2021, my blood sugar control suddenly deteriorated and I came across your book and switched to a very low carbohydrate diet. 
Initially, my blood sugars were wonderful. Sadly, as time has gone on, I am taking more and more insulin for less and less carbs. Any thoughts? Well, this, this, this is a guess coming up now, but something like this happened to me when I got COVID and then developed long COVID. Um, you've heard about long COVID syndrome. And one of the things I unfortunately discovered is that starting weeks after the incidence of a COVID event, my insulin requirements started going up. Uh, I originally was taking uh, basal bolus insulin, that is rapid acting for meals and Traceba long acting insulin for the fasting state. So, in, so if I didn't eat all day long, I would take four units of Traceba twice a day. And I took these four units every single day. Well, after a few weeks of long COVID syndrome, aside from all of the other situations they predict, my insulin doses went up from four units twice a day to 20 units twice a day. And it did not make me hypoglycemic. In other words, I became very resistant to injected insulin. So I warn you about this. I could have made a wrong guess in your case, but it's certainly something that everyone should be aware of, certainly insulin users. But even type two diabetics can become more insulin resistant to their own insulin uh, if they're exposed to COVID. Can my eight year old <clears throat> Type one granddaughter benefit from using CBD oil. C CBD oil is a cannabis derivative. It's outlawed in some states. It's being used um, in illegal or improper fashions by many um, non-professionals and even professional practitioners. Um, it's principally used to control pain for which it may or may not work. It certainly is not appropriate for treating diabetes. Um, there are some uh, practitioners who are selling this stuff and um, claiming that it's a cure for gastroparesis, which just uh, is not likely at all. Um, so I would advise you to stay away from it. My son has type one diabetes. My question for you is what would you recommend and consider in the context of celiac disease? It is barely mentioned in your book. Well, celiac disease is uh, basically an allergy to a protein called gluten. Gluten is principally found in wheat derived products. It's a protein <clears throat> and when you're allergic to it, uh, you can have all kinds of symptoms. Most commonly um, is uh, diarrhea but you can also get constipation. You could even get uh, anaphylactic uh, results. Um, usually it's diagnosed by testing the blood for antibodies to gluten. Uh, and there's a, a gluten antibody profile that the lab uh, can provide. It's a blood profile. Um, and then if that's positive, uh, your doctor may want to order an endoscopy that's um, where they insert a tube down your nose into your uh, throat into your duodenum and they slide the uh, fiber optic uh, probe downward taking pictures and showing the uh, operator 
uh, the inside of the intestines on the way down, starting with the duodenum. And uh, with celiac disease, what you usually see is a cutting off of the villi. If you look at the inside of the intestines under a microscope, you see what looks like fingers sticking up that provide a lot of surface area for the absorption of nutrients. But with celiac disease, these fingers look like they're chopped in half, maybe two thirds, so that they're no longer as long as they would normally be. And just looking at these chopped off villi is diagnostic for celiac disease. So um, it's a good idea to get a gastroenterologist who specializes in this and let him order the tests and even perform uh, the um, endoscopy perhaps for making a diagnosis. And then these specialists in cel celiac disease usually know how to prescribe a gluten-free diet. And a gluten-free diet uh, can be sort of strange because it's not merely the elimination of wheat and wheat products, but there are other substances. For example, um, instant coffee uh, frequently has a lot of gluten, gluten in it uh, and other packaged products that you would not ordinarily suspect. So uh, you need an expert in gluten-free diets. Um, if you look them up on the internet, it depends upon the source you go to. There may be accurate sources for these diets and there may be fictitious sources. Our daughter is 14. Can you please discuss the other missing hormones in type 1 diabetes people? I know that insulin is not the only issue. Um, since diagnosis almost three years ago, my daughter is constantly hungry. I wonder if there's anything we can do about it. Well, <clears throat> there are a number of things you can think of. And I'll mention a few. They may or may not be appropriate. Um, one thing is that uh, the use of metformin, which is principally given to type 2 diabetics, can reduce hunger in some people. So that's a possibility. Another um, thing to look at is hyperthyroidism. Uh, people with diabetes <clears throat> uh, are often found to have other autoimmune disorders. More commonly is hypothyroidism, low thyroid, but there are some people who have overactive thyroid or they may have low thyroids and the doctor may be giving them too high a dose of a thyroid hormone and that can cause hunger. Um, then there's um, the ADA a classic method for treating diabetes where they give the patient a long-acting insulin and uh, they give too high a dose and the patient is forced to eat all day to prevent low blood sugars uh, that the excess insulin is causing. So it could be that she's getting a long-acting insulin at too high a dose. That's another possibility. Um, Yet another possibility could relate to another hormone called amylin. The beta cells of the pancreas don't only make insulin. They make a hormone called amylin. And amylin is a major satiety hormone. It takes away hunger. And it actually... <clears throat> um, crosses the blood-brain barrier and can uh, tell the brain, don't be hungry. So um, it could be that you have a type 1 diabetic who's had uh, destruction of beta cells and 
the beta cells are making, ordinarily would be making amylin, but since they don't exist anymore, this satiety hormone doesn't exist, and therefore your daughter is hungry. Um, amylin is available synthetically, and there are uh, a group of hormones used to treat type 2 diabetes that include um, amylin. There, there are what are called um, GLP-1 agonists that stimulate the production of amylin, but there is also directly synthetic amylin, brand name Simlin, which can uh, uh, cause satiety. So there, there are a number of products available. Um, it requires a lot of investigation. My nephew is eight and a half years old and his tonsils were removed when he was two and a half. He has been diagnosed with type one diabetes since two and a half years. And after several months, he developed hypothyroidism. At the beginning of the winter, he fell ill with a cold and he continued to have congestion and a change in voice. Um, the doctors have recommended a surgical adenoidectomy, that's removal of small organs in the um, uh, respiratory system called adenoids. Um, and uh, is this a solution to his problem? And what steps should be taken before the surgery? Well, as far as steps before surgery, we do have uh, sections on this subject in my book, Diabetes Solution. Uh, but your story reminds me of my story. And my story may or may not apply to your nephew. It could be I'm making a bad guess, but I have another disease that one can say is worse than diabetes. It's caused, called common variable immune deficiency, where I do not make enough immune globulins to prevent me from getting sick. And when I was a small child, certainly uh, we were aware of it when I was an infant. I was sick all the time. I had chronic diarrhea and always upper respiratory infections. They did a tonsillectomy on me. They did an adenoidectomy on me. These did no good. Um, and we didn't, there wasn't even a name for my disease until I was perhaps 60 years old. And there, it, at which point it was just being taught as a rare disease in medical school. And when I was in medical school, I was 50 years old. I was not taught about it. Um, now, my sinusitis by the time I was 60 was so bad that I had on my desk uh, a hot steam vaporizer all winter long, all summer long, was constantly breathing it because I just couldn't breathe without it. On top of that, I had constant diarrhea, couldn't leave my office, and I was in pretty sad shape. I suspected that I might have an immune disorder. I didn't know about this particular one, but I uh, had blood drawn from immunoglobulins, and lo and behold, I had a uh, severe deficiency of IgA, IgG, and IgM, three immunoglobulins. Um, and when we started replacing the immunoglobulins with intravenous infusions every three weeks, the symptoms went away. And the diarrhea went away, the sinusitis went away, etc. 
So um, now uh, I still get, I've been getting for more than 20 years intravenous infusions of gamma globulin every three weeks. Remote possibility, but certainly your do, your uh, nephew's physician should contact an immunologist who should consider the diagnosis of CVID, common variable immune deficiency. And I might add that I have a number of patients who do have this disorder. I am 48 years old and have had type 2 diabetes for three years. For the first two and a half years, I was on a daily injection of glargine insulin and a, a low carb diet. My A1C was around 5.5, it came down from 10.1 when it was when type 2 was diagnosed. I was taking 14 units of glargine per day and small doses of Umalog after my meals if my blood sugar went up. My current A1C is 5.1, which I'm very pleased with. But since I started the Umalog, I've gained, gained 10 pounds. Um, why is this happening and what can I do about it? Well, what this person is doing is generating, uh, he's, he's not really following what's called a basal bolus regimen. A basal bolus regimen, which is one that I invented, uh, Kirka 1969-1970, um, where you get a long-acting insulin that just covers the fasting state and then when you eat, you get a rapid acting insulin, usually regular insulin, that just covers that meal. What this person is doing is taking the long acting insulin, eating a meal, the blood sugar then goes up and he chases the blood sugar with a rapid acting insulin. Uh, the net result is that he ends up taking more insulin than he would need if he did not allow his blood sugar to go up. That is, if he took the rapid acting insulin X minutes before the meal in just the right amount to cover the meal. This means that you'd be eating pretty much constant meals from one day to the next so that you'd know how much insulin to cover it with in advance. If you're covering the meal in advance and you're taking the right dose of insulin, you're not likely to be over insulinizing and therefore putting on weight because insulin is an anabolic hormone that builds weight. Uh, you don't want to be taking more than you really need. I'm 18 years old, A1C 5.1 for the past few months. I'm seeing floaters in the, in the bright sky are these floaters a complication of diabetes and could they be reversed with even more stable blood sugars? Well, we can learn a little about what, the, what is causing the floaters if we know what they look like. For example, um, if the floaters are little black pinpoints, little black, tiny black dot that um, uh, seems to uh, be in one eye, not the other eye. And you tell if it's one eye, you cover one eye. And if the floater disappears, you know that it's in the eye you covered. Um, and if it's a little black dot, it's that's a red blood cell. If it's several red black dots, that's multiple red blood cells, which su suggest some kind of a bleed or maybe a tear. Um, another kind of floater is a, a, a sort of a clear object of uh, an erratic shape, not a clear cut shape. Uh, it may look like a drop, it may look like an elong elongated drop, or may look like a fish, um, etc. Um, 
these floaters can be caused by uh, retinal tears. Um, a common cause of retinal tear is myopia, nearsightedness. If you're a high myope, as I am, um, sooner or later, usually as you get much older, um, the um, vitreous in the uh, uh, adjacent to the retina of your eye gets sort of stickier and um, uh, the shape of your retina gets more is is very curved because of the myopia. Your eye is more egg shaped and not spherical and that off spherical shape stuck to the sticky vitreous can get torn and you get uh, you might get a little tear. People who are severely myopic can get a severe tear and I knew one person he was my um, biochemistry teacher in medical school who was very high myope and he was practically blind in both eyes because of these retinal tears. So you should see a retinologist uh, and also an ophthalmologist. Uh, one deals with the back of the eye, the other guy deals with the front of the eye. And they may be f women, not always he. I'm able to prevent the dawn phenomenon thanks to your book. But recently I am facing a problem that is after a nap of two hours in the afternoon, my blood sugar rises uh, 10 milligrams per deciliter um, from 85, so from 85 to 95. I am currently using uh, Traceba, that's the long-acting insulin, twice daily. I can't take the intramuscular shot to bring my blood sugar down because of the five hour rule. Well, this person apparently has listened to my videos where I uh, warn people that if you're going to uh, chase elevated blood sugars with rapid acting insulin, uh, give the prior shot a chance to work before you take another shot on top of it. Now, um, what I would probably recommend in this particular situation uh, is first of all, to find out why you need a nap every day. Um, it could be that you're hypothyroid and that needs to be treated um, I found that since I developed the long COVID syndrome, I have to get m much more sleep than I used to get before I developed it. So it pays to uh, see a physician to try to find out why you need a nap. Um, the other, the other uh, thing to consider is if you really want to be chasing uh, these high blood sugars and you want to find out does it happen every time you have the, the nap or is it happening on that time at that time of the day even when you don't have a nap well if you find out that it happens every time you have a nap and if it's always by the same amount then it would be reasonably safe to take the right amount of insulin that uh, that brings you back brings you uh, down by ten. Now that's a use likely to be a very small amount of insulin, and it might have to be diluted insulin. So all the more reason to read my book uh, on the use of diluted insulin, how to do it, and so on. Um, uh, you can't just uh, guess at the amounts. Uh, when you're dealing with about such a small blood sugar increase and one option is just not to chase the increase at all, let it happen.
I'm a type 1 and have been living with diabetes for eight, since 8 years of age. I am frustrated with the current help I am getting and want to know if you have any doctors you can recommend to follow your uh, philosophy and diets here in Australia. Oh my. Well, I actually have had several patients from Australia, uh, some of whom I treated for a number of years. One of my patients actually sent me a wombat. These are little creatures that dig up her garden. They have very nice tunnels. Uh, and uh, this is my friend that uh, I've had for a number of years. He's already pretty dusty. Um, so we do uh, provide long distance uh, care for people for whom my book is inadequate, but I would certainly advocate that you read my book, Diabetes Solution, because most people who read it find that they can take care of themselves. Now, if you want to find someone in Australia who will maybe go along with a low carbohydrate diet, maybe, uh, you can contact my friend Ron Rab, uh, Ronald R A A B, who is president of a company called Insulin for a Life. So if you look up on the internet, Insulin for Life, um, they give away free insulin uh, to people in countries that have shortages of insulin. Um, he may know of someone, of a doctor in Australia, that uh, might be able to help you. And I'm sure you could find your own wombats. I would like to ask your opinion and advice whether low carb diet is still doable with an Omnipod. Okay, an Omnipod is a system where um, a little, um, let's call it a hollow uh, plastic device is adhered to your skin and has a little catheter that goes, a little microscopic catheter that goes through your skin and dribbles small amounts of insulin uh, based upon uh, algorithms that are given by uh, usually by your iPhone uh, and a continuous glucose monitor. Uh, the problem with the um, system is that the algorithms are usually uh, incorrect. Uh, they usually um, uh, assume that people are eating a lot of carbohydrate that carbohydrate is the only food that affects blood sugar and that before meals you can actually calibrate, cal you can calculate how much insulin this device should be giving you based upon the amount of carbohydrate you're getting. And this is when you really don't know the amount of carbohydrate uh, because um, someone hands you an apple. How on earth do you know exactly how much carbohydrate is in that apple? Um, so it's uh, a semi-fictitious si system. Um, it has been shown to be better than just taking insulin in a haphazard way without any guidelines whatsoever. So for people who are constantly guessing at how much insulin to inject, who have not read my book, uh, who are taking uh, large carbohydrate diets, um, this thing has shown, been shown to be somewhat better. It uh, gives them lower A1Cs, but slightly lower, and slightly less risk of hypoglycemia. Um, now, can you use a low-carbohydrate diet with it? 
it will probably, as with other systems that people may devise uh, for feeding diabetics, uh, the less carbohydrate you take, uh, the less insulin you inject, the less trouble you're going to, the, the, the less mistakes you're going to make. Or I should say, the smaller the mistakes. So the less carbohydrate you take, the smaller the mistakes. So there's an advantage to using less carbohydrate with the Omnipod, but um, it's not going to get you the uh, kind of normal blood sugars that we're actually seeking. My family doctor wants to prescribe me Zoloft for my mental health. Please let me know what effects this will have on my type 1 diabetes, especially my insulin levels. Well, uh, the Zoloft can have a slight effect, no effect, or significant effect. Um, I think that uh, from the little experience I've had with it for my patients, um, I'd say usually it's no effect. However, you can find out by having a fast day where you don't eat any food, you take your long-acting insulin, assuming you're taking long-acting insulin, um, and if you're not taking any uh, insulin, uh, you take whatever diabetes medication, you don't take any diabetes medication, um, see what happens to your blood sugars without the Zoloft, and then take the Zoloft for a day. Uh, actually, you might want to do it three days in a row because it might have a long-acting effect. Uh, see what the effect is. Um, uh, if you're eating food with the Zoloft, you're confusing the situation, the, confusing the experiment. So the experiment should be done when you're not eating food. Now, on the other hand, you might want to talk to a psychiatrist who has a lot of experience with the Zoloft, who may have treated other diabetics and may know in advance what the usual effect is. We are from Argentina and have an 11-year-old son. Unfortunately, we cannot find an endocrinologist in our country who follows your method. Is it possible to have an interview with you or by video conference? Okay, I, I guess I should have mentioned this. Um, one reason we have our videos is because my book, Diabetes Solution, may not cover all of the new things that have come up, such as new medications and so on. So we're doing these videos in order to update you. And it could be that you feel you need so much updating that you want, it, you want to get it from the horse's mouth and on the horse. So we do arrange um, Skype uh, conferences with patients. And I had one today with a, a patient and her mother. Um, and uh, the phone number to book a conference, uh, I ask you to uh, dial the following number in the USA. The code for USA, or the overseas code, I believe is 01. And then you deal, dial 914-705-9933. 914-705-9933. Um, some of these patients from out of town um, uh, end up remaining 
patients for extended period of time and we're in touch with them. We own, they only need me every few months. So this is available. I've had two different and unrelated surgeries in the past and it seems that they inject glucose into the IV to raise blood sugar to what they call com comfortable, although very elevated blood sugar levels so that they don't have to worry about hypoglycemia. How can I circumvent this issue and make sure they keep my blood sugar as close to 83 as possible? I assume the main reason they do this is to prevent a lawsuit. Is there a contract I can write up saying I won't sue in the case that I have severe hypoglycemia? <laughs> well, first of all, I'd suggest that you look at my book, Diabetes Solution, the uh, 2011 version, and on page 482, which I believe is in the appendix, uh, is a prototype letter that you can uh, doctor to your requirements uh, that you give to your surgeon. You um, give him an extra copy so that he could sign a copy and give it back to you. And you make sure that he agrees to whatever the terms are that you're going to require. Um, it will be helpful to him if you don't um, limit him to uh, a single blood sugar, namely 83, uh, but give him a wider range. Uh, maybe let let your blood sugars go from, um, uh, say, uh, 75 to 150. Uh, those are not going to kill you, but um, they'll keep you uh, away from hypoglycemia and ketoacidosis. Um, my doctor tells me that I have to expect my honeymoon period will come to an end soon. My question is, how can I prevent my pancreas, uh, no, preserve my pancreas to produce insulin for long or forever? Well, this is a sort of an, I call this an educated guess on my part, because I've treated a few patients where I get to see the patient at the time of diagnosis. This is um, very hard to do um, unless you're a hospitalist and working in the hospital. I don't work in a hospital, so it's very rare that I'm the first doctor to encounter a newly diagnosed patient. Um, and what I try to do is keep their blood sugars really normal, and for adults, this would be a target of 83. Um, uh, as soon as we can safely get to that level, we might have to start a little bit higher. Um, and when we keep the blood sugars at that target or so very close to that target, um, their insulin, their initial insulin doses seem to remain constant. And the classic case was uh, a lady who I uh, diagnosed um, in 1985 who was um, related to a friend of mine and I diagnosed her diabetes. Um, she was, uh, and I had her immediately doing blood sugar self-monitoring back in the days when that was prohibited by the ADA. And um, we started her on a dose of insulin. All her basal bolus doses totaled what a non-diabetic, her um, height and weight uh, would be making. I should say weight. Um, 
And that was, uh, I'm sorry, we started on half the dose that a non-diabetic would make. And here, after 40 years, she's still getting half the dose that a non-diabetic would make and still keeping her blood sugars essentially normal. Um, so that's possible. I've done it with children and there we keep them again in there. If I've encountered them early at the very beginning, we keep their insulin doses level. We keep them making C-peptide, but sometimes when they become teens, they become more difficult to treat, tougher to stick to the diet, etc. And what I see is that once their blood sugars go up, their C-peptide goes down. They're no longer making insulin. So it appears that if you can keep the blood sugars normal from the time of diagnosis or close to normal, uh, you can preserve the honeymoon period. My diabetes educator says that every moment my blood sugar falls below 65 milligrams per deciliter is damaging to my heart. Is the body really that sensitive to low blood sugars? Well, if you have congestive heart failure, which um, is your heart is challenged every time your heart rate speeds up, then you're in jeopardy if your blood sugar goes too low because usually for low blood sugars, the body makes adrenaline that speeds up the heart and the speeding up of the heart that's already partially dead, partial, the heart muscle is partially dead when you have congestive heart failure, um, uh, you could be precipitating a heart attack. So if you have congestive heart failure, um, I'd be very careful to avoid low blood sugars, more careful than ordinarily. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if this is an 18 year old recently diagnosed diabetic who was told this by his diabetes educator because many of the diabetes educators uh, are taught ADA guidelines. Okay. Here's someone complaining about carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, the carpal tunnel pain comes and goes, uh, but have only Over the counter, oh, this person is taking over the counter pain relief sources when I can get it. And um, do I have any recommendation? Well, carpal tunnel syndrome is really a mechanical syndrome. Uh, I may have re uh, mentioned it in some of my videos. There's a band around the wrist called the carp carpal band. It's principally made up of the protein collagen. Uh, collagen is a very long acting, long lived pro, uh, protein. Uh, in a young person, the half life of co collagen in the body is typically uh, about 21 years. Um, if you have high blood sugars, glucose, will stick to many proteins in your body, sometimes causing damage or problems, such as the frozen shoulder that we frequently mention. Um, and when it, and it, uh, when it sticks to collagen, it is there a long time because the collagen is around a long time for years and years. And therefore the, the glycated collagen can build up and get stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. Glycated collagen is stiff. So the 
carpal tunnel, instead of being flexible, gets stiff and tight and squeezes the median nerve, which uh, appears in the wrist, doesn't appear it exists in the wrist. Um, so um, that can cause pain and or weakness. And um, usually the uh, a typical symptom of carpal tunnel syndrome is you try to hold a piece of paper between your middle finger and your thumb and the doctor pulls the paper away and you can't hold it. I can hold it. I don't have carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, what do you do for it? Well, what is unfortunately done too commonly is a surgeon will cut some of the fibers in the carpal band, making it more stretchable, relieving some of the symptoms. But uh, you're still glycating it with the high blood sugars, if you're getting high blood sugars, and it gets stiff again. So you keep cutting fibers until you have no more carpal band. That certainly ain't the solution. Uh, another solution is to wear uh, what's called a night splint, a splint that holds, a Velcro splint that holds the hand in a neutral position. This is a neutral position and takes this um, strain off the carpal band, doesn't stretch it. Um, some people have to use a carpal, uh, a, a, a Velcro device even during the daytime. Uh, there's one thing that one can try that I have not tried on uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, but in theory might work. Uh, and that would be to have a physician, possibly someone who's familiar with hand anatomy, hand surgery, um, make a mixture of collagenase, that's an enzyme that dissolves collagen, a mixture of collagenase and DMSO. And this might relax the carpal band. You, you rub it on the carpal band, all around the carpal band, let's say two or three times a day and see if over a period of months, the pain gets relieved. You might still use the splint, the Velcro splint. Um, if you have a computer, I, and use your computer, I recommend that everyone, even people who are not diabetic, use a wrist uh, pad uh, in front of their um, uh, keyboard to prevent uh, injuring the carpal band or uh, overstressing the carpal band. This holds the carpal band in a neutral position. So um, uh, a smart doctor might want to experiment with a mixture of collagenase and DMSO. DMSO is a solvent that can, and it would be diluted DMSO, um, and it helps bring the collagenase through the skin. Uh, I do use such a treatment to treat um, Dupuytren's contracture, which uh, involves swelling of the tendons in the palm of the hand that occurs in many diabetics. And I think that we have a video on that uh, in, our, in the collection, Diabetes University. When starting low carb, um, I gave up potatoes, bananas, apples, and bread. I was shocked by the instant drop in my insulin requirements, my basal insulin requirements. In other words, this person is wondering why his long acting insulin dropped um, um, when 
uh, it was the meals that he changed. Uh, he takes Lantus insulin and his Lantus insulin dropped from 50 units a day to 18 units in the first few days, um, which he says is a 65% drop. Well, he was 50 units of Lantus insulin. Either he's, uh, well, he's, I was going to say he's a very obese person, but he's not. He's, um, he's of normal weight. So he's getting far more Lantus basal insulin than he would need to, than a non-diabetic would make to cover their basal insulin requirements. So he's on a typical ADA regimen where he's getting a huge amount of um, Lantus insulin and uh, it's forcing him to eat large amounts of carbohydrate. So it's pretty obvious what's happening. He's eating carbohydrates in large quantities that take a while to digest. Um, um, a banana may start working in a half an hour and continue raising blood sugar for the next four hours, five hours. So it's like um, fighting the Lantus insulin. Um, this is an obvious thing and it's very commonplace and um, it's has it relates very much to the common mismanagement of diabetes, over insulinizing and forcing people to eat. I would like to know when I can expect to see a revised edition of the book Diabetes Solution. Well, the current edition, which is still selling, is still a bestseller on Amazon and gets um, more than 300 five-star reviews every month, um, is really gives you the bulk of what you need to know. The videos that you're now watching are meant to update you. They're attempt, an attempt to update the book. So between the videos and the book, um, you probably are getting enough. And the amount of time that I have to put in writing a book is horrendous. Um, trying to get someone to work on it with me, I know of no one who is either smart enough or educated enough in the realm of diabetes to be of any help. I'm 88 years old. Um, no way am I going to spend the rest of my life rewriting that book. I'm 52 years old and following your program. Um, I find that I have a plantar wart on one metatarsal head that's um, causing me pain even when I wear my inserts, these are orthotics in his shoes, um, that are attempting to keep the pressure off the plantar ward. I know you generally advise against cutting and solicit salicylic acid for uh, treating um, diabetic feet. Uh, have I any safe alternatives uh, besides uh, a surgical attempt or an attempt to modify my inserts. Well, there is a way and it's a very simple way. And I used to use, the, I remember I was the director of the peripheral vascular disease clinic of a major New York City hospital. And I had people who came in with plantar warts, also people who came in with ulcers on the bottoms of their feet. And you cannot heal an ulcer by maintaining pressure on the ulcer. So I had to get the pressure off the ulcers and you can also cure plantar warts by getting pressure off the plantar wart. And so this is what I did. 
I took a piece of self-adhering felt and I cut it to the shape of the uh, inside of the patient's shoe. I traced his foot on the felt. Here's a picture of the self-adhering felt. And notice that I have two X's. One X is where a plantar ulcer would be, where we would cut away a piece of the felt. And the piece of the felt is a circle around the ulcer. And I wrote down no. I have an X next to it and I write down no. And then I have another cutaway that goes to the outside of the felt so that it is not acting like a tourniquet. It's allowing blood to get in uh, at the side of the felt because it's, there's no pressure there. So by making the second cut, not the first cut, I don't make a circle around the plantar, the, the location of the plantar wart. I make the second cut, the, 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 um, the, the, the cut that looks like a circle with a pipe coming out of it. That's the way to take the, all the weight off the plantar uh, ulcer. Now, this self-adhering felt, which you can purchase at surgical supply dealers, um, may over time get compressed by your weight, by your body weight, in which case um, maybe there's some pressure on the plantar ward again. This time, you, instead of using quarter inch felt, which is what we started with, I'm sorry, we, instead of using eighth inch felt, which we started with, we start with quarter inch felt. And the quarter inch felt is not likely to compress so much that um, it'll actually press on the plantar ward. So uh, try to make, take a look at this picture and try to print it on your computer and save it. And uh, you could show it to your pedorthotist, you could show it to your physician, and this is what you should be doing. Now, in theory, it's possible for a pedorthotist to manufacture an orthotic that does just that trick. And when I was a kid, I had a plantar ward on the sole of my foot, and my doctor actually knew a Pete orthotist who could manufacture stainless steel orthotics that took the pressure off one spot and cured my uh, plantar ward. Uh, but that's very hard to find nowadays. You're not likely to find it. Despite your work, the overwhelming majority of diabetics can't get a normal A1C due to so much misinformation or managing our, for, on managing our disease. It seems that we're faced with a very stubborn force in the medical industry and nutritional world which comes to something as basic as what a target blood sugar should be or what a diabetic should be eating or whether a diabetic should be eating massive amounts of carbohydrate each day. My question is how can I get involved to carry the Bernstein message forward? Is there some kind of action committee or political or social organization anywhere that I can volunteer my time to. Um, Dr. Dykeman or Dave Dykeman, oh, she wants to help me, let us help you, Dr. Dykeman or Dave Dykeman with get, getting your message out. Um, I guess you can converse with people in, the, in Dr. Dykeman's Facebook page uh, and if you join the uh, the group 
maybe you can get some other people with ideas uh, that you can come up with. Um, I cannot think of any offhand. Uh, I'm doing the best that I can, and uh, I don't know what to suggest. So here's one I can't handle. I'm lose, looking to lose more. Oh wait, what? Wait, I'm looking to lose more fat. Do you think metformin will help me reduce my insulin requirements, increase my sensitivity, and lose weight? As this is a, or is this a bad idea? Um, you could try it. Um, if it's okay with your doctor, there are certain contraindications to metformin. There are certain potential side effects. Um, we have to uh, do certain tests uh, to make sure that you don't develop a B12 deficiency. Um, so um, it's worth trying. There are other substances um, that have been uh, known to reduce appetite. Um, uh, some people have found finasteride uh, lowered appetite, um, uh, but I don't. Uh, there is a new product out, but I haven't. I, I haven't tried it on my patients yet. Um, uh, we'll be letting you know if we find it to be helpful. Um, Massachusetts General Hospital is in phase two of a clinical trial of doses of BCG vaccine to tame the autoimmune response and treat the root cause of uh, type 1 diabetes. What is your opinion on this? Well, uh, Two groups, I believe, at Harvard are using, uh, I don't believe, are using uh, BCG, which is um, uh, a vaccine to immunize you against tuberculosis. I think they're using the adjuvant for BCG, which is uh, a compound that's added to the BCG to make it more effective. Um, and uh, I think they're adding the adjuvant to an antibody to GAD, which is uh, a protein found on the surface of the pancreas. Uh, so it could be that whatever your source of information is, uh, it's given you misinformation. And um, this will certainly not get to the root cause of diabetes, to my knowledge, um, uh, I believe that there are a mixture of causes of diabetes. Uh, for example, one group uh, attempted to find out how many different antibodies are present in the type 1 diabetic population. And they over a period of years, they were able to um, isolate more than 100 different antibodies. So here we have one group focusing on GAD, which is one antibody, um, one antigen. Uh, so um, uh, I doubt that this is going to, and certainly this is not going to cure existing diabetes. Um, they're attempting to prevent diabetes, but um, thus far, uh, they've, they've not done so. They're, they're still in clinical trials. They may have uh, finished the trials that uh, demonstrate no harmful effects. Well, that's it for today. Um, remember that uh, if you really find that you need more detailed help uh, coping with diabetes solution. 
uh, you can phone uh, USA code 01 and then 914-705-9933. 914-705-9933. Uh, keep checking with uh, um, YouTube, uh, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University for subsequent editions. Thanks for watching and stay well.